Uh, this is uh, Jared Gardner, and I'm here again with Dr. Andrew Rosenberg. And if you haven't seen the first video that we did, I'm going to post a link in the video description down below and also in the uh, upper right corner of this video. So click on that and learn all about the embryology of bone and also uh, normal bone uh, histology and physiology. Great video. So we're going to talk more about cartilage and some other things. Uh, thanks again, Dr. Rosenberg. Thank you. So we're going to follow the same uh, scheme as we did for the first session, and I'm going to be talking about the embryogenesis and development of articular cartilage and some of the pathological changes it manifests in association with a variety of different diseases. Taking a step back, reminding everyone that cartilage in the body first begins to develop around week six and then is soon followed by the process of ossification. We are looking at a young embryo at the residual cartilage and laga composing the epiphysis of the proximal tibia that extends down to the region of the metaphysis. The articular cartilage is derived from the end of the cartilage analoga. During the process of ossification of the skeleton, after the primary center of ossification forms and the cortex develops along the diaphysis, subsequently, and it's all genetically controlled and is in the same in each human, the epiphysis will develop a secondary center of ossification. Although cartilage is largely avascular, during fetal growth there are scattered large vessels that course through the epiphysis within which and around the blood vessels bring in or provides a pathway of access for stem cells to be present once the secondary center of ossification begins to form in the center of the epiphysis. This section is from an embryo that is several months older in which we have a well-formed growth plate. This is the primary spongiosa in the region of the metaphysis and now in the center of the epiphysis, the secondary center of ossification has begun to develop. This process will continue in a 360 degree fashion and extend towards the articular surface of the tibia. And as we look at it in greater detail, we can appreciate the formation of the primary spongiosa, the development of a medullary cavity within the region of the epiphysis. If you also look at and analyze the cartilage in the region adjacent to and chondral ossification, you can see that the cells recapitulate the organization seen in the growth plate, although the different zones are considerably shorter. Keeping in mind that an articular surface such as the femoral head or the tibial plateau significantly increases in size from the time of birth to an adult, the articular cartilage also has to increase in size. And the mechanism that the body has for that is the provision of growth plate-like cartilage present in the secondary center of ossification. What subsequently will happen is the secondary center of ossification will enlarge such that the end of the bone, the epiphysis, will be composed purely of cancellous bone and marrow, and there will be a well-defined growth plate. We will now take that step to adulthood where the growth plate has closed, and we now have a true articular cartilage. We are looking in the center of the epiphysis of a femoral head. 
composed of trabecular bone and marrow. The articular surface is lined by hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage is composed of chondrocytes that account for about 2% of the wet weight of uh, the structure. The main structural protein of hyaline cartilage is type 2 collagen, and they are arranged in staggered uh, fashion, forming arcades. Mm -hmm. So long arches with the base of the arch towards the bone and the horizontal interconnection of the arch towards the articular surface. About two-thirds of the wet weight of hyaline cartilage is water, and the remainder are a variety of different glycosaminoglycans. The true articular cartilage extends from the surface down to an undulating blue-purple line that you can see here. And that blue-purple line is known as the tide mark. And that purple-blue line demarcates the true articular cartilage from what is known as the tide mark cartilage. And what the tide mark cartilage represents is the residua of the growth plate-like cartilage that is present in the epiphysis as the epiphysis increases in size. And at the time of puberty, that residual cartilage undergoes mineralization. So it's calcified cartilage, and that undulating blue line marks the demarcation from the calcified cartilage, i.e. residua of growth plate-like cartilage, and that cartilage that is considered to be the true articular cartilage. So the true articular cartilage is not anchored to bone. It is the tide mark cartilage that is anchored to bone. This cartilage and the chondrocytes that are present, although we don't see any in this field, maintain the biological potential to undergo reactivation, if you will, in the appropriate setting. So if this adult were to develop a pituitary adenoma that secretes growth hormone, these chondrocytes will become reactivated, form tissue very akin, akin to growth plate-like cartilage, and in that way, the length of the bone can increase even though the growth plates have closed. When that process happens, it usually results in loss of congruity of the articular surfaces of one another in the specific joint, and those patients get premature osteoarthrosis. Mm. And there's an example in Hollywood, in movies. For those who are familiar with James Bond, in the movie, I think it was Goldfinger, there is a big, tall individual known as Jaws who has metal teeth. He is big because he developed a pituitary adenoma that secreted uh, growth hormone, and when you see him trying to move, he has difficulty because he was developed, he was, uh, had already developed um, osteoarthrosis. Mm. In normal articular cartilage, the chondrocytes are individual, arranged in a relatively random fashion and surrounded by equal amounts of matrix, which is usually basophilic or sometimes eosinophilic in appearance. If you look at this image, you notice that there is evidence of clustering of chondrocytes, where the chondrocytes are separated by very little or no matrix. This reflects response of the chondrocytes in the <coughs> articular cartilage to mechanical stress. And so Generally, chondrocytes have very limited capacity, or I'll, I want to rephrase that. Generally, chondrocytes in true articular cartilage have very limited capacity to undergo cell division. And the rule of thumb is you're, the set of chondrocytes you're born with is the only set that you're going to have throughout your lifetime. The exception is in 
diseases associated with mechanical stress. There is limited capacity for the chondrocytes to undergo cell division, producing offspring that tend to occupy a small area. And the histological term for this clustering is called cloning of chondrocytes. When the chondrocytes are newly formed, they are manufacturing and secreting newly formed matrix, newly formed type 2 collagen fibers, newly formed glucosaminoglycans, and the staining characteristics of that newly formed matrix is different than the matrix that is older. Mm -hmm. So another early feature of osteoarthrosis, aside from the cloning of chondrocytes, is inhomogeneity of the staining of the matrix, which you could see very nicely here. In the normal articular cartilage, the surface chondrocytes, the very surface chondrocytes, their lacunar space tends to be parallel to the articular surface following the direction of the neighboring type 2 collagen fibers. When there is both biomechanical and biochemical changes associated with osteoarthrosis, the very first collagen fibers to be lost or digested are the type 2 collagen fibers that are located right on the articular surface. And so you lose the horizontal connections that are interconnecting vertically oriented towers, if you will, of type 2 collagen fibers. Once those connections are lost, it predisposes to the formation of vertical cracks through the thickness of the articular surface. Those vertical cracks, when numerous, produ produces what is termed fibrillation of the matrix where the surface of the articular cartilage will become very feathery in appearance, and that has not happened in this articular surface at this time. Mm. Yeah, so what this is, this is a saffron and O. Oh, I've heard of this, but I've never yeah. seen so it. So this is wow. a saffron and O. It was developed by an orthopedic surgeon. His name was Larry Rosenberg. And the cartilage stains red sort of red-orange. And so we see nice articular cartilage staining the way it should. Uh, this is a tendoligamentous insertion site. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we have cartilage at the tendoligamentous insertion, remember that tendons and ligaments, and we see it right here, it is composed of what's known as dense regular connective tissue. Dense regular connective tissue are big, thick bundles of, of collagen, type 1, that are closely opposed to one another, all going in the same direction. So that's tendons and ligaments. When tendons and ligaments get into the region of where the collagen fibers insert into the bone, you get a transition from dense regular connective tissue or dense regular fibrous tissue to fiber cartilage and fiber cartilage is a tougher, stronger tissue, and we're seeing a nice example of the presence of the matrix of the mucosoaminoglycans uh, staining with the saffron and O at the insertion site. Now, when it inserts, they can also calcify and weld it to the bone, right? Well, no, yes, you can get calcification fiber. of the collagen fibers yeah. at the insertion site. When you get calcific tendonitis, you can get deposits of calcium hydroxyapatite in this region of the insertion and also in the tendon and ligaments. The name of the collagen fibers that go into the cortex and are anchored into the cortex, those are known as Sharpie's fibers. Mm -hmm. So they're just collagen fibers and sometimes you can follow collagen fiber here, extra osseous, going right into the bone. Cool. So is that, is that a fibrocartilaginous fiber? Is the, is it's a type 1 collagen fiber. Okay. And a lot of fibrocards like the meniscus, yeah. it's not type 2 collagen, it's type 1 collagen. Yeah. 
And so this yeah. is a yeah, type one collagen molecules going from the fiber going from the dense regular fibrous tissue into fibrocartilage anchored into the cortex. So we are now looking at a articular surface that is close to normal and it's the articular surface of the humeral head. We for emphasis the art, true articular surface extends from the very surface where it is in contact with synovial fluid. Remember, the cartilage is avascular, does not have a lymphatic supply, and does not have a nerve supply. These chondrocytes get their nutrition via the process of diffusion, and all of that is coming from the products that are present within the synovial fluid. So we have relatively random scattered chondrocytes surrounded by abundant matrix. At the very base, we have the tide mark and the tide mark cartilage. For those who can appreciate the subtle changes, even in this relatively young patient, we have very early changes of cloning of chondrocytes and inhomogeneity of the staining of the matrix. And as we'll come to see, the possible reason for these changes is the fact that the patient does have a neoplasm not too far away, and you can see that the neoplasm also is composed of cartilage. So in end-stage osteoarthrosis, once the cartilage has undergone fibrillation, once the cartilage is markedly thinned, and all of the true articular cartilage and the tide mark cartilage has been lost, we now have an exposed bony surface. That exposed bony surface represents the subchondral bone plate that normally supports the articular cartilage. And as the articular cartilage becomes thinner and thinner, the subchondral bone plate increases in thickness. So instead of only being a fraction of a millimeter in thickness, in this example, maybe 20, 30 times its normal thickness. The histological term for this increase in thickness of the subchondral bone plate is known as sclerosis. And that term is also used uh, with regards to the interpretation of radiology. Notice, however, we have cartilage extending from the surface into the underlying thickened subchondral bone plate. When we look at that cartilage, we can see it has the appearance that looks like almost of an admixture of fibro and hyaline cartilage. So when we look at the cartilage, a lot of this cartilage is more cellular than the articular cartilage. And when we move around in some of the cartilage, we can see eosinophilic fibers. When you can see collagen fibers in cartilage, that is the morphological definition of fibrocartilage. So the cartilage we're seeing is sort of an admixture of hyaline and fibrocartilage. And the question is, why is there cartilage right in the middle of the ebernated bone surface or the sclerotic bone surface? And the reason is, is that bone was not meant or is not meant to be an articular structure because its degree of elasticity and flexibility is limited. And so what happens when the cartilage is lost and the bone is now the articular surface, it undergoes microfractures. Mm -hmm. And what you're looking at is an area of a microfracture, the subchondral bone plate, producing cartilage. The Almost same like a tiny thing. Callus, huh? This is a formation, this is a form of callus. Wow. And when you see it well developed, <clears throat> sometimes that cartilage is going to protrude from the surface beyond that uh, ebernated bone surface. And when you see it grossly, bone ebernation is defined as bone that's an articular surface. And again, 
one of the hallmarks of osteoarthrosis is when one side of the joint is abnormal, the other side shows congruent abnormal uh, uh, changes. So when all of the articular cartilage is lost in this femoral head, you would expect all of the articular cartilage of the opposing acetabulum has been lost and we have bone articulating against bone. That is like polishing marble. So the ebernated surface looks like shiny marble. And when you're looking at an ebernated surface with micro fractures, with well developed micro callus, it looks like you're looking down on a man's head who was bald, who had recently had hair transplants, where you have plugs of tissue extending above the surrounding bony surface. Where, as you know, a bald head is usually nice, smooth, and shiny. Now, it is through this process of developing microfractures that you get the formation of subchondral cysts. And that, again, is the microfracture provides pathway for synovial fluid to be pushed into the underlying bone. And in the uh, subchondral cyst, you can see the proteinaceous material that's present in the synovial fluid, and whatever is in the synovial fluid can get into the cyst. So if pieces of articular cartilage, cartilage are floating around in the synovial fluid, you can see loose fragments mm -hmm. of articular cartilage, loose fragments of bone. You can get crystal deposits, and sometimes in osteoarthrosis or non-infectious -infla non inflammatory arthropathies where you get subchondral cysts and you also get an exudate in the synovium, i.e. lots of neutrophils in the synovial fluid, you can have a cyst filled with what looks like pus huh. and can be a mis- there could be a diagnostic pitfall because when a pathologist sees pus in the bone, their immediate reaction is, oh, this must be uh, some form of osteomyelitis. And the way to distinguish true infection versus an aseptic accumulation of neutrophils is that the surrounding bone in infection for long distance shows marked irritative evidence of irritation, marked fibrosis, scattered chronic inflammatory cells, whereas in the setting of an aseptic accumulation of neutrophils, the bone, the marrow not far away, viable, looks mm, unremarkable. That makes sense. Very different of what you would see in infection. Now, the other finding I could ask the question, how do we know this very sharp surface was not uh, formed by a pathologist using a scalpel? And that's because <coughs> when you look carefully at the bone tissue in an area of hibernation, you will always see the surface lacunar spaces are empty because the surface osteocytes are necrotic. And the reason why they're necrotic, when you have bone articulating uh, against bone, and you can use an example, if you rub your hands together quickly, it generates heat. Well, bone articulating against bone generates enough heat so it kills the surface layer of osteocytes. And so you always see this, quote, secondary form of microscopic osteonecrosis that is largely limited to the very surface area of the thickened subchondral uh, bone plate. All of the bony trabeculae underlying the thickened subchondral bone plate also become markedly thickened, as we see here, causing the bone to mimic cortex with the production of reversion-like structures. And these cysts can sometimes become very large. These cysts sometimes can dissect deep into the underlying epiphysis. And what can happen in that scenario is you get secondary microfractures of the intervening bone between all of these deep-seated cysts, and that results in osteonecrosis of those abnormally thickened bony trabeculae. So that is a form of 
secondary osteonecrosis mm. and I don't see that in this field. We're now following residual articular cartilage and we're coming across a region that looks peculiar where we have cartilage with underlying bone, cartilage, underlying bone. It's like a sandwich. And the question is, why do we have cartilage on and bone overlying the residual true articular surface? If we look carefully at this articular cartilage, we can see that it shows a greater degree of cellularity. We also can begin to see some eosinophilic fibrillar material, which represents collagen fibers. This is the type of cartilage that has the appearance of an admixture of fibro and hyaline cartilage that forms the surface of an osteophyte. And that cartilage that forms the surface of the osteophyte recapitulates the growth plate-like cartilage and undergoes enchondral ossification, producing the bone. And this structure overgrows the lateral aspects of the true articular cartilage. So in severe osteoarthrosis, we have loss of tissue. We have the production of new tissue in the form of new bone producing subchondral sclerosis, uh, in the form of cartilage and fibrous tissue as a component of microfracture, and in the form of osteophytes. And osteophytes develop in two, in my experience, in two general anatomic regions. At the sites where the joint capsules insert into the bone, the joint capsule is lined by synovium. At that junction of the synovial insertion into, say, the base of the femoral neck or in the proximal portion of the uh, uh, tibia next to the plateau, you get this secondary production of newly formed cartilage. If you will, in the past, they were, our simplistic explanation was is that this newly formed cartilage was being produced to overgrow the area that had undergone severe damage secondary to osteoarthrosis. And it is never successful, but this is its morphology of fibro and a hyaline cartilage-like tissue undergoing enchondral ossification, overgrowing the lateral aspect intact portion of residual articular cartilage. That's what I have to say about osteoarthrosis. Okay, well thank you so much for going over that with us. And are there any other cartilage related things that you wanted to show? I would love to. Yes, please. <laughs> if there's anything that you guys would like to see, um, we can do that. Sure.